I want to appreciate every single one of you here. I don't think I'm standing here in my own strength because it is God that lifts people up and positions them where they ought to be. And I count it a real privilege and an honor to be here. You know, when we want to, when we gather like this in a meeting, like this, um, you can see here, there are no two faces that are the same. We're all unique, fearfully and wonderfully made by a God. Praise the Lord. So you have no competitor. God just made sure that we're all unique in our own different ways. Isn't that amazing? I want to appreciate my sister, Miss Pedro De Niro, my sister Stella Bass, and all the wonderful women who have made it possible for me to be standing here. I remember I was at Lincoln Fellowship where they invited me to their meeting and we had a wonderful time. It was so funny that even before my sister called me to say they wanted me to the keynote speaker at this conference, the Holy Spirit spoke to me at that meeting that day that I was going to be speaking here. Isn't God amazing? It's just incredible. The day she was calling my phone, I was telling her why she was calling me. <laughs> God is amazing. He is a good God. He never makes a mistake. And you know, from my experience, because I had a unique type of breast cancer a few years ago. I'm going to tell you a bit about that. But, you know, I was going to work every day. Nobody knew what I was going through. What I'm trying to say here is, as we are sat here this morning, every one of us has issues. Nobody might know about it. In fact, after reading my book um, on how I stood up to cancer, a friend wrote me just this last week. She read it. She sent me a note. She said, your book helped me. How? She said, I was ministering in the choir on the Sunday, just this last two Sundays ago. But I was so ill, but nobody knew it. Because I had read that your book, it strengthened me. Praise the Lord. And that is why we need to read, to have an open mind. So, thank you again for having me here. I want to assure you that God knows where you are hurting. Might be in your marriage, with your children, in your health, your finances. But God wants to assure you that you will not leave here as you came in Jesus' name. He is going to meet you at your point of need. He is a faithful God. I'm a living witness standing here. In fact, I can change my name. For one of my books, the title is The Greatest Debtor to His Love. Because I have, seen the, I have seen God show up for me. I can keep you here. I mean, I've had TV interviews with the BBC on my life. I was on Revelation TV when I was sharing the story. My, my story. I mean, I can keep you here all day. One BBC reporter described my life as dramatic and eventful. She came to our home twice to interview me. She said, I can come every day because it's like every aspect of my life is a story. But you see... Like the Apostle Paul said, the things that befall us lead to the furtherance of the gospel. If God counts you worthy to be a vessel in his hands that he wants to use, it's because he wants your life to be a story, to encourage people. My own story starts with the fact I never knew I was meant to be an aborted baby. My mother said, after she had had the first two children, those days, I was born in 53, and they were just living in one bedroom, and she said, that's when she realized that she was pregnant of me. My father said, what? Another baby in this one room. What is that baby going to eat? Who is another? Anyway, to call this story. She said she tried everything to abort the baby. Not that she thought about it. She tried. And I'm standing here as a living miracle that, Lord, you gave birth to me without any deformity, no disability with everything she tried in those days. Our God is good. Our God is good. And the devil knew. He tried to get rid of me because he knew that I, do you know, I hate the devil with sword passion. Oh, chaka. I tell you, I hate the devil and he knows. Ah. 
You see, when, when he tried me with cancer, I said, oh, is that all you can do? You, choose, you chose the wrong person. And I'm going to teach you a lesson. Praise the Lord. Because the greater one lives inside of me. So when I had that cancer, let me tell you, I went to work every day. Nobody knew. Going through all the treatment, everything. I said, double, you are a liar. You think, I'm not, I'm, my testimony of him will be sweet. I'm not going to tell you and tell them I have cancer. I don't have it. It's under my feet. In Jesus' name. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, Shaba. <laughs> ah, kingdom woman, prepared for purpose. We, keep, we always talk about kingdom, the kingdom woman. Do you know, please, you must forgive me. Today, I was actually meant to launch my book, Are You a Kingdom Woman? I thought I was going to launch it today, but it's done. The fly is here. I'm going to have it distributed during the lunch break, uh, tea break or something. So that, and then I have um, a sheet on the table. I have my books on the table. I'm going to talk about them briefly. I was going to launch this book today. Well, not launch, release it. Because, you see, we keep talking about the kingdom and all that. But um, the question is, what is this kingdom we are talking about? And I want, so these are the books. This is how I stood up to cancer. This book has helped many people. As I said, my friend who read it just this last week, and she, she came back to me and said, wow, you don't know what that book did to me. This one, The Greatest Debtor to His Love, saved two women, as I know, from suicide. They wanted to, they thought they had hit the end of the road. But after they read this book, they got hope again. Many people, in fact, this, this book, I mean, it's, you see, when people write books, it's not, it's, if it was just about the money, then do you think of, how many of us have written a book? Do you know how long it takes to write one book? So if it's just about the money, it's not the money. It's just for you to be blessed. It's, safe, it's something you can give. In fact, out, my neighbors, every one of them has a copy of this book, so they have no excuse. This one, Your New Life, was my very first book I wrote many years ago. Because in the university sector, you come across a lot of people. And they, they were giving their lives to Christ. Because as far as I'm concerned, anywhere I'm, I'm carrying the kingdom of God there. So people were getting saved. And I didn't have something. I went to the bookshop looking for something. Because Jesus said he wants us to disciple people. It's not just getting them saved. And I was looking for a tool. I couldn't find God said, you have to write it. That was how I wrote this first book. So if you are here, you have a passion to see people grow up in their work with God. That is a book. It's all on the bookstore. I've got the new edition of it, Your New Life. A second edition of it is all on the table. This one, The Touch Bearer. You see, in 2012, I was nominated to be one of the Touch Bearers when they had the Olympic Games. And, of course, I wasn't interested because I, I don't like showcasing myself. It's not about carrying the torch and everybody seeing you, you know. Because, why did they do that? Because of this charity, Book Aid for Africa, that has, God used me to start many years ago. We've shipped books to different countries in Africa. As for Nigeria, North, East, South, West, everywhere has benefited from books. We ship the books, we send them free because that is one of the opportunities that we have been in the education sector. So when they nominated me to carry the Olympic torch, God said to me, that was when I was diagnosed with cancer. I tell you, it came from nowhere. I shared my testimony at the women's conference. It was at a conference like this. When they said, you know, one of the workshops, seminars, it was on health. And when they talked about examining your breast. And that, so that morning in October, I was sleeping. I just felt like examining my breast. And what happened? I felt, I just woke up. I felt strange. I said, what am I? You don't know what a lump looks like. Because as a woman, you know, you don't know. I thought, I, I panicked. I said, what is this? I picked up my phone, called the GP surgery and all that. Anyway, so the Lord said to me, it's not about carrying a physical torch. How do you shine your light when you are going through a challenge like this? 
That is what is important. That was how this book came about, The Torch Bearer. How do you shine your touch when you are going through? Ch- Who wants to go through cancer? And do you know my cancer? They said they had never seen the type before. If you want to find out more, this book and the other one, you know, I can keep you on and on. But I'm just trying to help us to see that you can see us. We are not all the same. People go through things, but we don't know. I had my first baby with a gun on my face in Nigeria in 1980. They were, were just, I went into labor. I almost lost, I almost lost that prayer. Even my life, that guy put a, a gun on my face like this. If you move, I'll shoot you. I was as good as dead. And if the pregnancy had not reached full term, I would have lost that baby. That was it. During the Civil War, you want to know? I will just save you the trouble. Just get those books. I'm just trying to share with you things that you can use to help people. That people who are going through things, you can get some tools to help them. So, what is a kingdom? We all talk about kingdom, kingdom. Do you know, when God opened my eyes to revelation of what the, his kingdom is, it changed my perspective. I've been working with Jesus since 1968. I was the first person to be saved in my family. And through me, I give God the glory. I remember when I got saved, a lot of persecution. Then, of course, in 1970, after the Civil War, I rededicated my life to God. You know, but I am just so grateful to God to see members of my family, all those who mocked me and said, you know, those days they called us SU and all that. But, you know, today people are beginning to appreciate what, that it's only Jesus that makes a difference in our lives. Praise the Lord. So what is a kingdom? A kingdom is a domain that is governed by a king or a queen. You see, in a kingdom, fortunately, I had the opportunity, my husband worked in Saudi Arabia last couple of years or so. I had the opportunity to go and actually work there. I was, you know, appointed visiting professor at one of the universities there. And I understood what a kingdom is. You see, when you see these Muslims behaving the way they behave, it's because they understand kingdom principles, and they're trying to get everybody to be like them. Whereas this is what we are supposed to be doing as children of God. Praise the Lord. Today, I'm going to do, use a little illustration that I always use to help us. You see, because once we begin to understand this, our mindset will be so different. In fact, your Christian life will change from today in Jesus' name. When you begin to see yourself the way God sees you, or the way he wants you to see yourself, you are not just, you see, Jesus we are going to read a few Bible passages. Don't worry, we are going to do that. But you see, when we begin to understand who we are in Christ, our perspective will be totally different. Praise the Lord. So we're going to try to illustrate this, our work with God, in a way that we will not forget it. I remember a lady met, uh, I was speaking at a women's conference in Manchester a couple of years ago, and I used this simple illustration. A lady met me last at our women's, in March, yeah, at the women's prayer conference with her. She said, oh, that your illustration really helped me. It has helped me to understand what this our work with God is about and this whole concept of seeing and all that. I'm looking at the time and it's not in my favor, but I'm going to use a little illustration just to help us. You know, before we leave here, we'll appreciate. So fortunately for me, I have, I'm going to borrow Brother Ikini and Sister Ikini, please. First of all, Brother Ikini, you don't mind because you're a couple. Do you mind coming, please? It will just help us to, our uh, people to understand. I'll, I'll, I'll have Brother Ikini first. And just praise God. Please give him a hand of applause. Thank you, my brother. You see, do you know, this is God, God our Father. He, he said, let us make man. You know, he, our father in heaven, he wanted his kingdom to be manifest in, in another planet on the earth. And he said, let us make man in our image. After he created the heavens, the earth, the seas and everything, he said, let us make man in our image. And he created man. And he said, it is not good for this man to be alone. I will make him a help me. My sister, please come. Uh, Let's give a round of applause, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. So, he now made a woman, a helpmate. Remember, we are made in the image of God. Can you believe that? In the image of God. That means 
we, are, we have unlimited possibilities. Because God breathed his spirit in us that we can do anything for him. God, we know the story. Made in his image. And God placed them in that garden. And then, of course, the devil came and said to the woman, did God say, God gave them instructions about, please, of, you can eat of every tree in the garden, of every fruit, everything, but this one tree, please don't touch it. The day you touch it, that's the day you will die. And he wasn't talking about a physical death, a spiritual death, because God wanted to reproduce heaven on earth. It's like, it's like the concept of, of colonization when the British colonized a lot of those African countries, they brought their culture with them. They made us speak English, eat English food, drink tea in hot weather, wear suits. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? It's true. In fact, I remember those days we were in the class. The, the teacher would beat you for speaking vernacular. <laughs> speaking your language. Why? Because they came to introduce their own custom to us. Yeah, that's what kingdom does. That's what, what God wanted to do when he created us, put us on the earth. He wanted the culture of heaven to be replicated on the earth. That is it. He wanted the culture of heaven to be replicated on the earth. The language of heaven, the custom of heaven, the system of heaven, the mannerisms, so that it will be heaven on earth. That's all. In fact, the other day, I, was, I went to a shop. I saw this plaque. It said, live like heaven on earth. I said, wow, I bought it. <laughs> but that was God's plan. And then the enemy came and caused problems. Ah. And then man disobeyed God. And then, of course, it, you see, when man disobeyed God, it was rebellion. Because sin is rebellion against God. And it introduced sin. And God said, okay, please move away from heaven to you. Sorry. So God chased them out of the garden. And then, of course, man was out of the presence of God. And then man started to reproduce, have offspring. Offspring that multiplied. And all that the offspring knew was a life of sin. Because they already left the presence of God. Are you with me here? Man started multiplying. And if, I, if you read Genesis 6, the Bible says that the wickedness of man was so much that God repented that he created him. So, sin multiplied on the earth, multiplied and all that. And it was like God said, okay, but I love the world so much. I'm going to send my son. I'm going to borrow Brother Yangi. Please, if you don't mind. Thank you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Thank you. So he said, I'm going to send a redeemer. My son is going to be born. Because I want to show these humans what I have in mind. He is going to be born like a human being, like by a woman. I don't know if I have enough time oh, to explain this. He's going to be born by a woman. He will live on the earth like he will have the same human nature, born, grow up in a home, so that they can see that this thing I'm asking them to do is not impossible. It's not. So he will go to, that is why the Bible says, we do not have a high priest who cannot be tempted with the same thing, because, but was in all points. He didn't sin. You know? So he now came to redeem man. Okay, so Go, take them, bring them back to where they were meant to be. Yeah, praise the Lord. <laughs> praise the Lord. <laughs> Thank you. But here is our problem. We are going to open our, please just sit there. Open our Bible to John chapter 17. Let's read something. So that we can understand where we are going. John 17. This is Jesus. Remember, Jesus had um, been with his disciples, teaching them, if, oh, I tell you, 
If you want to go back to basics, just go back and start to read Matthew from chapter 5. Just see what kingdom principles are like. That is what Jesus called us to do. He's trying to teach them. Listen, in the, in the world system, it says, hate your enemies. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But in my kingdom, it is love your enemies. Pray for those who despitefully use you. If somebody slaps one cheek, turn the other. If somebody says, go with me, one my go to. It was just teaching a totally different, because that is kingdom culture. You know, every kingdom has a constitution. The constitution we have is this word of God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. This is our constitution. This is the, the, the language of our kingdom. So, Jesus, let's read something in John chapter 17. This is Jesus praying. Now, remember that his disciples had seen Jesus perform all sorts of miracles in the world. But then, they saw that Jesus would always withdraw himself to go and pray. It was like, this thing that this man does, there must be something in it. And then he said, they said to him, Lord, teach us how to pray. And then he said, when you pray, say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Can you imagine how important it is that the will of God is done on earth as it is in heaven? Have we ever sat down to imagine what is this will of God? I said, please, I'm so sorry. Try and put your name and get a copy of this, my new book, Are You a Kingdom Woman? Do you know, I was reading it again, I'm thinking, it's going to be out in the next three or four weeks. Uh, it, it, is, um, it was anointed by God because so that to open our eyes to understand this kingdom that we are called to live in. And now Jesus, they said, let your kingdom come, your will be done on it. I'll quickly read this. This is Jesus praying for his disciples in John 17 from verse 9. He says, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And here is what he says, verse 14. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Praise the Lord. So here is our problem. We are in the world physically, but the word of God says we are to have a kingdom mindset. A kingdom mindset so that if the world does things this way, we say, well, I'm sorry, that is not the language of my kingdom. Praise the Lord. In the kingdom to which I belong, mm, we don't say those things. We don't do those. So that is what bothers me. When I see children of God, women of God, who should be role models, and we start competing with Hollywood stars in the way we appear, we have allowed the world to take us, well, us, us, bring them. I was in Saudi Arabia, for goodness sake. And I had to wear that black thing, whether I liked it or not. <laughs> because that is their cause culture. So why, why are, you, are you competing with the Hollywood stars? These days it is fashionable. If you want to know whether you are trendy, you have, your, your, your jeans has to be ripped. Because you are modern. Your breast has to show the shape and the curves. For goodness sake, kingdom mindset. In the world, not of the world. We are to influence the world, my sisters. The world is waiting, watching to see us be examples. We present ourselves honorably before God. You, you know, how can you appear in the house of God if, the way you will not appear before the Queen of England? Did you see the royal wedding? Did you see anybody with breast showing? And they were all in hearts. So if it is good for a royal earthly queen, how about our heavenly father? 
you know? So that's our mindset. Our mindset. That is the burden I have on my heart. That, you know, we are physically in the world. Physically, that's the problem. But we are supposed to be living the kingdom life. The kingdom life. What does it look like? What does this kingdom look like? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You see, in the churches today, we don't teach kingdom. We're teaching all sorts of things. The process, you see, the process of getting people into the kingdom is that by being born again, except a man be born again. And then when we are discipling them, we are helping them to understand that you are in the world, kingdom culture, but you are not of the world. You are not competing with the world. The problem is that because the Bible says, mm, we are cast and set us free. It says in Galatians 5, do not take your liberty as an occasion to the flesh. We are supposed to, it says, God has given us his, his um, authority to go in his name. He has created us in his image, in his likeness. He's equipped, he's breathed life into us. He's equipped us with everything we need to live the kingdom life. Praise the Lord. We, he said, we are made in his image, in his likeness. We have his Holy Spirit. So, and that's why Jesus said, the works that I do, you can do, and greater works. Because I go to my father. But the problem is that we are struggling. The world is pulling us. You see, we are, we are in this kingdom, and the world is pulling us. We are, we are back and forth, back and forth, confused. But we shouldn't be. Because it says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you may know what is that good, an acceptable and perfect will of God. Praise the Lord. Not everything is acceptable unto God. Not everything is acceptable unto God. He said, do not use your liberty as an occasion to glorify the flesh. We have been called to freedom, but we've, we've taken it overboard. You see, but thank God, you see, Jesus doesn't judge us necessarily by our actual appearance, but there is some, the Bible says, let your moderation be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. He wants us to live. When you live here today, what does it mean like to live heaven on earth? I asked them to give us a little video. I don't know if it can come on now. Thank you very much. I can release you. God bless you. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. So last Sunday, I met a man that greatly inspired me. I'm talking about Charles Muli from Kenya. Shout out to my Kenyan people. This man's story has been made into a movie. And if you are yet to watch that Muli movie, please, please, you can rent this movie or you can buy it on YouTube or Google Play on that movies and TV. But you know, this story is so inspiring that it can change your perception about acquiring wealth or living the successful life. Honestly, I cried while I was watching this movie. And without telling you everything, because I want you to watch it this man came from nothing and his parents abandoned him at the age of six and for 10 years he begged for food on the street he slept on the street the day that this man decided that he would commit suicide someone invited him to church and he decided to go just to see but that day he heard a message of hope that there is a purpose for his life and so he gave his life to Christ that day and he decided to walk for three and a half days he walked on his feet until he got to a city the city of Nairobi where he found a good Samaritan that took him in he started working you know as a layman he was later able to buy a taxi and then another taxi and then another one and this man became a multi-millionaire he married a beautiful woman he had eight children and traveled the world now this was not included in the movie but he told us that when he became wealthy he went and found his parents who abandoned him at the age of six because they thought he would die he was always getting sick and he brought them into the city and built them a house he built them a house as in he forgave them including relatives that refused to give him food he forgave all of them and he became so rich that he would take his family on vacation in america europe asia he owned all kinds of companies and properties he was changing cars like every few weeks until one day his life was changed because street kids stole his car and that reminded him of how he used to live on the street as well begging for food and you know he couldn't get it out of his mind for days and you know that because of that incident this man sold all his businesses he stopped working and he started bringing in street kids 
fatherless children, abandoned children into his own house. He didn't start an orphanage or send them money or give them scholarship. He wanted to give them something that he didn't have when he was growing up, which is a father figure. So he became their father. And from taking in two children, they became four, they became 10, 30, 50 children in his house. And every night he will go to the slums of Kiberia and he will find a child that was left to die and he will bring them home. He and his wife took care of these children. And they gave them food. They put them in school. They bought them clothes. They taught them all kinds of vocational jobs such as sewing, painting. Some of these children were child prostitutes. Some were drug addicts, but he brought them all in. Later, they became 100. They became more than 100 and the house became too small for them. So they had to move to a countryside where they had more land. And then they got to 1000 children. So they built them schools because he could no longer pay school fees of so many children. So they built their own primary school, their own secondary school. And do you know that their school is ranked one of the best in all of Kenya? And every year their school is rated as the best in their district. They even teach them karate. Can you believe that their karate team went to represent Kenya at the African Olympics? Honestly, this family went all out and huge kudos to their eight children. I cannot imagine that it was easy and huge kudos to his wife for accommodating her husband. So they've been doing this now for 29 years. So 29 years years and can you believe that they have successfully raised more than 13,000 children 13,000 who are now on their own we're talking about professionals businessmen business women doctors lawyers entrepreneurs some of these children studied abroad some of them even live abroad now I'm just saying that their lives have forever been changed and you know what they all call him daddy because he was the father that they knew they presently have about 3,000 children that they are taking care of right now even as we speak they have their own choir by the way and sometimes they will fly them to canada or other parts of the world to perform <laughs> But you know, it wasn't easy. When you watch that movie, you would cry. There were times that they had no food. There were times that they had no money. <laughs> there were times that they had no water, especially when they moved into the new location. But they kept going. People laughed at him. His friends said that he was crazy. Even his church abandoned him. They were telling him, you know, it's okay to help from afar. You don't have to bring them into your house. You know, please watch that movie if you can. Honestly, it's life changing. We need more people like Muli. You know, the whole time I was watching that movie I kept thinking about so many wealthy people that we have in my country Nigeria and the lives that they could change instead of buying private jets and preaching about prosperity honestly I don't think that Muli has to preach to any of these children because you know action speaks louder than voice nobody can fight real love above all this man is the definition of humility I mean he doesn't even know what he has done he was so humble and you know in the movie he decided that he would not depend on donors because he remember what it was like when he used to beg he said the beggar has no choice he said he wanted this work to be self-sustained and with the help of these children that he has adopted they started farms and they were able to produce more than they need such that they are now a major supplier of food produce in Kenya for real if you think a lot about making it in life being successful please watch this movie because suddenly you would realize that even though you are not where you want to be there are people that are not as fortunate as you and you can make a difference in somebody's life you don't have to be moly you don't have to bring in thousands of children but maybe there is a child out there that you are the only one that can help or maybe there's a family out there that because of proximity to them you are the one that can help them I'm just saying watching this movie would inspire you to touch other lives this is not an orphanage some of us were orphans but now we have a home I used to go to bed hungry change is possible restoration is possible with God all things are possible right here I have learned this is true Welcome to my home. Welcome to my family. The biggest family in the world. You guys now don't know much. Guess what? I'm just keeping it real. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You see, somebody may want, want to find out what does the kingdom of God look like. You've just seen it there. Bringing heaven on earth. Making a difference. Do you know that Jesus, when Jesus 
started his, God, the, his message, the Bible said, everywhere he went about preaching the gospel of the kingdom. When he appeared, he said, the kingdom of God has come to you. Do you know that everywhere you and I appear, that should be the message that we have brought God's kingdom. That is, honestly, that's as simple as it is. That when you show up, it's like switching on a light in a dark room. So imagine, why would you want to go and be dark, add more darkness to darkness? But that is what we do indirectly. Every time you conform, you compromise, you are actually adding darkness to darkness. You're supposed to switch. If somebody says, okay, it's okay for this to happen because this is how, what the law says or this. Well, well, okay, yes, I have no problem with your law, but my, the kingdom to which I belong I don't argue with you about your, what you believe, but so I'm sorry, but in the kingdom I belong to, this is how we do things. That is why you see these Muslims, they will not eat this, they will not, because they are focused. They, there is no compromise, but we are the ones always wanting to compromise. I'm, I'm sure some of us have come across Rick Warren's book, um, Purpose Driven Life. It talks about your shape. That is why you have no competitor. Your shape S-H-A-P-E. As a woman of purpose. I mean, there are so many examples of women in the Bible. God, is, God used Rahab, a prostitute. It doesn't matter your age. Look at Naomi. It doesn't matter your circumstance, your position. I want to talk, wanted to talk about Mary, the mother of Jesus. We talked about, you see, the devil used a woman, Eve, to bring rebellion, and God said to use another woman, Mary, to bring his, ch- his son into the world. I remember when I was sharing with the Lincoln, you see, the Bible, in, in Luke, to the, the angel told Mary, you are blessed, you are highly favored, the Lord is with you. She's engaged to be married, and now, because of her faith, she believed she got pregnant. Her husband was going to put her away secretly. Imagine what she would have gone through, the humiliation. How do you explain to the neighborhood that you got pregnant through the which Holy Spirit? <laughs> what is that? The gossip she endured to, in order to carry out that assignment? If you are going to be a woman to be used by God, be ready to be misunderstood. Imagine Rahab, a prostitute, how, how, eh? we, we found pastor so, so and so in this woman's house. A prostitute's house. How do you account for that? You see, when you are focused on the purposes of God, it doesn't matter what people think and say. God is ready to use you. But ready, Mary was ready to allow God to interrupt her plans. She had planned her wedding. Her bridesmaids were all sorted. Imagine that conversation with the mom. Mom, mm, I'm not sure this wedding is going to take place. So the mom will say, you must be joking. Which angel did you see? So what do you want me to tell all these people we have invited? Ah, please, you're not going to disgrace me. But that is it from the world perspective. But when you are a kingdom woman, you are ready to be used by God. Anytime, anyhow, anywhere, you are ready for him to interrupt your plan and purpose. Your shape, that's why I say you have no competitor. Your shape is as your spiritual gifts. God has put in you specific gifts he wants you to use for his kingdom. H is your heart, your passion. Look at that man. You see, sometimes I've just come back from Nigeria. I tell you, I was worried for myself. Because every time I go there, my heart, I have to watch my heart. I was crying. You know, the driver, these boys were coming to, to, you know, when you're in the car on on the street, they come and put things on your face. I was just crying. I said, God, eh? look at this able-bodied young man with potential, just waiting for somebody to do. What, what, God, what is going on? I'm telling you, I had to say, God, please, take me out of here. I can't handle it. That is why, you see, I had the opportunity, as I said, being in the education sector. It was in 2000. I used to be a lecturer in the University of Lagos in, you know, when I left, uh, from 1980. I left there in 1989 when I came to England. And then when I went back in 2000 for my father's funeral, I decided to go and visit. And I went to the library and I'm thinking, what's going, you know, the, the books were so out of date and all that. And that's how we started this charity, Book Aid for Africa. Do you know, 
we've shipped container loads of books to the books are there. Our warehouse is as big as this place, full of books. We ship them free. But it requires people. What I'm trying to say is, we, God has called us to make a difference where we are. Some of us, of course, I thank God for people who go on medical missions. People are doing various things in their different ways. You know, that's your heart. A is your ability. God has given us abilities in different ways. Things that we can do. Look at what that, how that man transformed. That is what life is about. Tell me, if you want to know fulfillment, that is it there. That thing we watch. It's not the number of cars. I heard a, a man of God saying how much he, he has 15 cars lined up in his driveway. He has the largest swimming pool here and all that. I'm thinking. There might be members in the car, in the church, with maybe six children who don't even have a car. You have to jump on the bus to come to church. And you are bragging you have cars in your driveway. Who, who cares? And so what? How many of those would you carry with you to heaven? Is it not, you know, imagine the joy of knowing that you see a family with no car. You just hand over a key to them. Hey, if you don't want, if you don't, I, I say, God, you have to bless me, please. I say, God, bless me. Not for me. That I can make a difference. In the lives of people, praise the Lord. That is what it's about. Oh, I honestly, please pray for me. I want God to bless me. <laughs> so that I can, I can be a blessing to people. I want to be able to publish books and just distribute them for free so that they will be touching lives. You know, but it costs money to print them. to pub You know, it's, it's that joy of making a difference. P is your personality. We are all different. Some of us are shy. Some of us are um, extroverts and introverts and all that. Whatever you are, wherever you are, God can use that. He says, in our weakness, God's strength makes manifest. And then E is for your experience. E is your experience. God can use your experience. Like I'm sharing, I put my own experiences in books that are helping people, changing people's lives. S-H-A-P-E. God can use you. The problem is some of us, we walk past our neighbors. We carry Bibles. Do they actually know that we are saved? Do they know that we are there to bring the kingdom? Is the kingdom of God manifest in your locality? Let me tell you, my neighbors, I remember in 2003, after we had lived there, I said, Lord, there's no way I can live here. And my neighbors don't know. They haven't heard the gospel. No. So I, I printed an invitation card. I went to every house, get to know you evening, a taste of Africa. I put it through the, all the letter and, I, and a, a reply slip. Please, just tick, yes, if you I put a date. I invited them to my home. Do you know, the place was full. They were so excited. I made African food. And then I put African, trying to, showing them the gospel in Africa. So I put my hand, bonke video for them. And what I'm trying to say is, how can you be there and they don't even know you are saved? I invited them. Do you know some of them were getting to know themselves for the first time? They live down that street. You know this part of the world, how people are, everybody mind their business. But we are there to bring the kingdom of God, to make a difference. We cannot just be going past your next door neighbor. I mean, I can keep you. Uh, well, I think I still have a few more minutes. There is an old man, a 90-year-old. He's going to be 90 this year. I'm, we are planning, God help us. I'm just praying, God, please keep him alive till October when he'll be 90. <laughs> you know, we, he lived at the back of our house. And we heard that he lost his wife. I was actually in Saudi Arabia when this happened. And then I telephoned my son. I said, please go and drop a card. You know, I, I dropped, no, I think it was before I traveled or something. I dropped a card. I said, oh, we are very sorry to hear what has happened to you. Please, if you um, don't mind, we, did, you know, we are very ready to you know, help anytime. To call the story short, that man, the other day, I went there last year. Yeah, his, it was his birthday. I go to visit him with a basket of fruits. and pray. He gave his life to Christ. We prayed for him. Praise the Lord. The other day, I was on the train, and I was sitting on this side, and there was a lady facing this way. And this, I was just sitting, and this lady... She came in with a young man. They were sitting there. She was just crying and crying. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh, my heart. I said, God, I wonder what is going on in the life of this woman. Sure, how can I be a blessing to this woman? So 
And I was coming down. They were continuing to London. I just wrote a note quickly. I said, I'm so sorry. I don't know what you are going through. But I've watched you weeping. And I'm deeply moved. I don't know what it is. But please just know that God loves you. I put my phone number. If I can help in any way. Do you know that lady rang me? She told me that she had lost, just lost her pregnancy. And she was crying. And she, do you know, after she got pregnant again, she contacted me. You see, what I'm trying to say, that God has called us to be, make a difference. That everywhere you are, you take the kingdom of God with you there. You see a situation, you step into that situation. I mean, I can keep you here counting things, but you see, every one of us, life is it's not just about us and our little family there. Your next door neighbor, in fact, many of them, the other day I saw an ambulance in our street, just across the house, across us. Ah. And I was actually having my devotion. I looked up because I was the only one at home with Jesus. And I said, let me see. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm never alone, no. <laughs> I was at home. I looked out of the window. I saw an ambulance. And I was waiting to see where, which house it was coming from, to know who it was, so that I would be able to go there and see how I can help. To call the story short, then I saw my neighbor, you know, being brought out. And then they took her into the ambulance. They said, ah, this is still an I didn't know what to do. They drove off, and fortunately, there was another, and I was just in my night. I said, ah, there's not, anyway, they, they drove off to the hospital. I said, okay. Then the next day, I saw, her husband wasn't there. I saw the man walking in the garden. I ran to him. I said, ah, you know, um, I saw the, I can't, did I see, I can't remember what happened, but anyway, to cut the story short, I took a card, and I quickly wrote something there, a get well card and a note to say, oh, that I saw this, please, if I can help in any way, just let me know. I dropped the card there. Do you know that lady, when she came out of hospital, she sent me, no, in fact, she, 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 so I got a message on my phone. It was from that lady appreciating me for what I've done to her. What I'm trying to say is we cannot see a need and walk past it. Because we are there to take God's kingdom there, everywhere, in your place of work. Oh, I can keep you forever. You know, where I was still working at my university, this colleague came to see me. She's, you know, she was going through some challenges. She came in to tell me, I locked my door. I said, she said she, she went to see the doctor, and they said they, they found a cyst in her stomach. I said, is that so? I said, do you, do you mind me praying for you? She said, no, I don't mind at all. I locked my door. I laid my hands on her to me. And she, she prayed, thank you, <laughs> thank you. Do you know, I laid my hands on her and she prayed for her. Just simple prayer. Uh, in fact, I never thought anything about it. It was two weeks later. I saw her. We went where we were collecting our letters. She was there. She said, oh, he said, Leucha, I've been looking for you. That she went to the doctor's. And they didn't find any cyst anymore. <laughs> Praise the Lord. In my little office there, it is the fact that I was ready to honor God, whether she was healed or not, as long as I was ready to put my faith on the line. It was God's business to do the, what he, he alone can do. And she testified that they didn't find any cyst anymore. Praise the Lord. Amen. I mean, God has called us We. We cannot, it cannot be business as usual. No. You see, we can, we can go from one conference to the other. It's not how many conferences. Or we know I am concerned about spiritual obesity in the body of Christ. Honestly, I am. Where we're just feeding ourselves, feeding ourselves. When we come to this, is to empower us to go out there and bring God's kingdom. Simple as introduce the king culture of the kingdom of God. This is how things are done in our kingdom. We don't speak that kind of foul language. In our kingdom, we forgive people. We don't keep malice. In our kingdom, you, you are not envious. You are not jealous of another man's gifts. In our kingdom, you love everyone. You don't despise anybody. You know, so this, this is what it's about, my sisters. That I'm praying that when we live here today, please help yourself by getting hold of some of those books. And this one I have just written, Are You a Kingdom Woman? Do you know, I put it in form of a question because it demands an answer. 
So when you finish reading that book, you will be able to look at yourself and ask, am I really a kingdom woman? And the book talks about how you can become a kingdom woman. Now we're going to rise up, please. And we're going to hold the hands of the person next to you. We want to really pray and talk to God about the things that we have heard today. You see, it, can be, we, it cannot be business as usual, otherwise we've wasted too much time today. Jesus says that he has given us dominion over everything to rule. We're supposed to be ruling the world. We are here to have dominion over everything, to introduce the kingdom. Because we've got the good news, the gospel of the kingdom, the kingdom that changes lives, that makes a difference. So another kingdom is there to kill. If you don't believe, we'll kill you. No, our own is to love people. It's the kingdom of love and peace. Joy in, it says the kingdom of God is love, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost. It's not eating and drinking and all that. Things. Let's close our eyes. Let's just, please pray for the person. Hold the hands of the person next to you. And just say, God, let your kingdom come in the life of my brother and life of my sister. Pray, pray for the person next to you. Pray, pray, pray. Let's pray for God's kingdom to come. Enough is enough. We are not here. We should be tired of playing church. It's not about playing church anymore. We need to bring the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. To change destinies. To change destinies. That's what we're about. To bring the kingdom of God into everywhere we are. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Shanda Asuko Koro Gushaka. Thank you, Jesus. Do something new in my life. Something new in my life. Something new in my life. Today, do something new in my life. Something new in my life. Something new in my life. Oh, do something new in my life. Something new. In my life, something new in my life. Oh, Lord, do something new in my life. Something new in my life. Something new in my life. To In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In the mighty name of Jesus. Ah, Jehovah God. Jehovah is your name. Jehovah is your name. is your name Jehovah is yes that is your name Jehovah we worship you Jehovah is your name hallelujah hallelujah mighty one yes great Jehovah is your name. 
Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Jehovah is his name. He says he has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. We should not be afraid to take the kingdom of God wherever we are. Because greater is he that is in us than the devil that is in the world. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. Lord, we worship you. Thank you for your word that has gone forth. It will not return void. Ah, Father, this word has fallen on good ground. In the name of Jesus. The enemy is not going to steal this word from our hearts. None of us is going back the same. As we are here, I know that your Holy Spirit has been speaking to our lives about what we are going to do. It cannot be business as usual, Father. It will not be business as usual. Lord, we are determined that you are going to use us. We are going to take your kingdom everywhere we go. You are going to use us to make a difference, to shine the light. A city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. Salt that sweetens the environment in the name of Jesus. Ah, we are going to be hope for the hopeless. In the name of Jesus. There's something I, I remembered. Sorry, as I was praying, the Holy Spirit reminded me. Do you know, sometimes we get these phone calls, or you are, you are, people call you over the phone, and you, like maybe the insurance company or all of that, and they said, okay, is there anything else I can do for you? I said, oh, yes. Before you go, can I quickly tell you that God really loves you? <laughs> Has, has a plan for your life. The postman that comes to your door, ah, they know me. I always look forward to them, those ones that bring parcel. In fact, on, in my porch, I put my tracks there. So when they are trying to rush away, I quickly say, please take, I share testimonials. We have opportunity, we are touching every time you come in contact with somebody. In the shopping mall, that cashier, do you have something you can leave for her? Or him. You know, we are so carried away with our own little world. We are just so focused on our business, our job. No! You are in the shopping mall. Lord, you, you wake up in the morning. Father, today is a new day. Use me to change somebody's life today. Use me to make a difference today. Ah, don't let this day go past without you using me to bless somebody. It might be on the phone. The postman that comes to your door. Ah, the person you meet in, the other day I was going to a shopping mall, I saw this little child in, you know, in this car in the shopping mall that the mother didn't have the money to, to get the, the car to be working. I just went there and put a pound for her and they were so happy. It is bringing, just making a difference, putting a smile on somebody's face. That you are there, that the, that person has a smile. There's nothing that sweetens my heart than to see that I put a smile on somebody's face. Oh, it does something for me. Oh, God wants to use us. We have opportunity. Maybe you are a businesswoman selling things. Don't just get carried away with what you are selling. Somebody has come there. That person has a need. It might just be a smile. Somebody might just a conversation. Jesus showed us an example with a woman at the well. Just give me water to drink. And the whole village gets saved through a conversation that just started. So we have to look at those clues, those opportunities that people, somebody comes in contact with us. I wrote a tract based on my encounter with my GP. The man, I saw him this week. By the following week, next, next week, the man was dead. I wrote a tract. I never told him. Oh, I cried that day, and that was a big lesson for me. I cried. My mom was saying, well, I said, Mom, I didn't tell this man about Jesus, and I'll not have the opportunity again. So everybody that comes, don't let their blood be on your head. So all my neighbors, every neighbor around me, none of them has an excuse to say they haven't heard the gospel. I don't want anybody's blood on my head. They will stand before Jesus on that day and say, ah, she was my neighbor. She passed every day. She never, I never knew anything. I never knew about the gospel. So we have a responsibility. The Lord will help us. Praise the Lord. <laughs>